Hello and welcome to another Passive Life video. This video is looking at the history of the World Solar Challenge. Many of the solar vehicle innovations that we see being used today by the Aptera and Lightyear vehicles were first put into practice during the World Solar Challenge. In this video, we're taking a quick look at this extraordinary event, its history, and how eventually it began to influence the consumer world. The World Solar Challenge was first officially launched in 1987 by the South Australia Tourism Commission and ran what is now called the Challenger Class event every three years. In 2001, this changed every second year. Renamed the Bridgestone World Solar Challenge in 2013, competitors are challenged to drive 3,000 kilometers on the course from Darwin to Adelaide in one of three different solar class vehicles. These are intended to push the boundaries of solar vehicle development. The Challenger class is the classic event that the World Solar Challenge is best known for. This is the cutting edge of SEV technology, containing the razor-thin, high-performance machines that can travel 600 kilometers a day using only the power of the sun. In 2013, a new class was introduced called Cruiser Class. Unlike the Challenger class, the Cruiser class aimed to inject some real-life relevance into the challenge. In this class, the vehicles would require at least four wheels and at least one passenger. The final class introduced in 2017 is called the Adventure class and is basically an event where everything goes. Here, there are far fewer restrictions aside from the safety and solar. But who came up with the idea of the World Solar Challenge in the first place? The story of the World Solar Challenge began long before in 1970, during, perhaps not surprisingly, the first global oil crisis, something that we are once again very familiar with. The supply of oil dropped by just 10%, but global markets immediately began to collapse as alternative sorts of power, other than fossil fuels, had simply not been prioritised. As a result, economies became unstable, people lost jobs and wars broke out on many continents. The crisis did have one positive outcome, however. It sparked the realisation that oil would one day run out and that we needed another source of energy to power, well, everything. And the search for an alternative source of energy began in earnest. As luck would have it, not long before the crisis in 1955, Gerald Pearson, Darrell Chapin and Calvin Fuller had invented the world's first silicon solar cell, an invention that changed everything. During this period of global upheaval, an idea struck an Australian adventurer by the name of Hals Tolstrup, an avid motor vehicle enthusiast who already had many world firsts to his name, including circumnavigating Australia in a speedboat, piloting a single-engine aircraft solo around the world, crossing the Bass Strait in a mini-moke strapped to a rubber dinghy, and riding a motorcycle around the world in 72 days. He wondered if it would be possible to travel across Australia in a car powered purely by solar. Naturally, everyone he talked to about the idea said it could not be done, and equally as naturally, Tolstrup took this as a challenge. Shortly after, he teamed up with Larry Perkins, and in 1982, with a little help from BP, they built a solar car called the Quiet Achiever. By today's standards, the Quiet Achiever may not look like much, but solar power was then still in its infancy, and $15,000 is a tiny budget for a prototype vehicle, let alone one running on cutting-edge technology. Like modern-day solar vehicles, the Quiet Achiever made the most of its solar panels by being light and efficient. It was hand-built by Larry and Gary Perkins, measuring 4 meters long, 2.1 meters wide, and 1 meter high, and was made of fiberglass on a lightweight steel frame. In total, it weighed just over 150 kilos, with an 8 meter squared PV collector, totaling around 1 kilowatt peak of power. This charged two 12 volt batteries, which in turn powered a one horse DC electric motor. All this allowed the vehicle to reach an average speed of about 14 miles an hour, which is more or less the same as a quick jog. Today, a high-end household PV panel can produce over 220 watts per square meter, almost double the 117 watts per square meter the Quiet Achiever cells could produce. But for its time, these cells were highly advanced. The rest of the construction, however, although functional and well thought out, was a far cry from the razor-shaped racers we see today. In its defense, aerodynamics would not have been an issue for the Quiet Achiever, simply because its top speed was severely limited by its power. Before the start of their journey in 1982, Hans Tolstrup said, We hope that by making this 4,000 km BP solar trek, we will motivate people to solve whatever problems are before us. If it will motivate just one more idea and thought in the development of solar power, then the adventure will be well worthwhile. The Quiet Achiever left Perth Scarborough Beach on the 19th of December 1982 and arrived 19 days later at the Sydney Opera House on the 7th of January 1983, a journey of more than 4,084 kilometres. After the success of the transcontinental journey, Hans wanted to expand his vision by encouraging others to explore the boundaries of sun-powered transport, and so the World Solar Challenge was born. In 1987, there were already 13 entrants from 5 countries, but by 2019, it had grown to attract 53 teams from 24 countries. In short, it was a stunning success. And the large part of this success was thanks to the spectacular array of vehicles that took part in the inaugural event. 
The first official solar challenge in November 1987 was from Darwin in the north of Australia to Adelaide in the south. The race course followed the Stewart Highway going past Alice Springs along the way. Qualifying to start the challenge in pole position was the General Motors Sun Racer, designed by Paul McCready from Aero Veronment, and close behind it was the Mauna La, meaning Power of the Sun in Hawaiian, otherwise known as the Windmobile, designed by Jonathan Tennyson. At the beginning of the challenge, all eyes were on these two spectacular looking vehicles. The Mauna La was the only vehicle on the field that was expected to catch the Sun Racer. At more than 5.7 meters, or 19 feet long, it was designed to use both the sun and the wind to propel the vehicle, and weighing in at 250 kilograms, it was lighter than the Sun Racer with four times the horsepower and a theoretical top speed of 85 miles an hour. Many expected the Mauna La to overtake the Sun Racer, but it was not to be. The Mauna La team pushed their vehicle too hard through the hills on the first day and by 4pm they were out of the race when their engineers realised that their batteries would take over 40 hours to recharge, an issue that highlighted the value of good battery design and tactical management for future races. The exploitation of the wind as an extra source of energy proved not to be as valuable as originally thought. At an eye-watering cost of over $250,000, that's over $640,000 in today's money, this vehicle was a stunning piece of conceptual engineering but ultimately one that lost out to the simpler concepts of its rivals. The Sun Racer led from start to finish and completed the 1,867 miles, the 3,005 kilometers of the challenge, with an average speed of 41.6 miles per hour, that's 66.9 kilometers an hour, finishing the race in just 5.2 days, 50% faster than the second place vehicle, which arrived in Adelaide two days later. Without a doubt, it was the General Motors Sun Racer that stole the show. This cutting-edge machine was so advanced, it barely looked like it had been made by humans at all. This car, more than any other, was arguably responsible for the continued success of the World Solar Challenge event. The world had quite simply never seen anything like it. Not surprisingly, its specification and backstory are also quite extraordinary. In just 10 months, Aero Veronment, led by the solar pioneer Paul McCready, designed and created the most advanced solar car the world had ever seen. Built for maximum efficiency using space age materials, the Sun Racer's frame weighed just 6.5 kilos and the outer shell was made from Kevlar. Including the batteries, the whole vehicle weighed just 265 kilograms and had a drag coefficient of 0.125. The colossal 8800 solar cell array could generate up to 1500 watts of power, pushing the Sun Racer to a theoretical top speed of 68 miles per hour or 109 kilometers an hour. A couple of years later, it casually set a new Solar World record, a title which it held until 2011. The motors were specially created for the Sun Racer by GM using a brand new rare earth magnet motor based on MagnaQuench permanent magnets. This new motor was very lightweight and 92% efficient, far beyond the efficiency its competitors could manage. The battery pack was comprised of NASA grade batteries, allowing the vehicle to start the day at full speed and giving the Sun Racer enough power to overtake petrol vehicles on the road. It even had a fiber optic rear view camera and space age glass filters that reflected nearly all of the sun's heat while still allowing the driver a clear view of the road. But all this cutting edge technology came at a cost. The Sun Racer reportedly cost over $2 million to build in 1987, which would today be over $5.1 million. This is an enormous leap over the quiet achiever, the equivalent of which would never be seen again. After winning the challenge and breaking all records it could, McCready casually noted that if he had been given a little more time to refine the shape, they probably would have made it 20% faster. The Sun Racer went on tour across the US before it was eventually donated to the Smithsonian Institute. The Sun Racer's success led directly to the creation of the first GM electric car, the GM Impact, which was also designed by Aero Veronment, although no solar panels were included, its sleek lines still echoing through to many EVs today. The GM Impact in turn led to the GM EV1, a surprisingly popular electric car which was leased to customers for a few years back in the 1990s before being controversially retired and scrapped in 2003 by the then CEO Rick Wagoner, who claimed that the GM could simply not sell enough EVs to make a profit. Amusingly, this was also the same year that Tesla was founded. The true legacy of the World Solar Challenge was of course its continued success and the countless minds that became inspired by the astonishing technical achievements of the participants. Taking just one example, the Brunel team from the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands has competed around the globe with more than 10 unique evolutions of their solar vehicle, winning the WSC no less than seven times in the process. With each event their experience grows, this real world, bleeding edge knowledge is then directly passed on to hundreds of engineering students that come through the university each year, and the same is happening all over the globe and has been for decades. It may have taken some time, but thanks in large part to the WSC and the innovations that were developed for the challenge, we are about to see the first real crop of solar electric vehicles hit the road 
roads within the next year. And not from one, but from three separate specialist solar vehicle companies, Aptera, Sono and Lightyear, all of whom have designed vehicles from scratch to harness the power of the sun. Lightyear's founder Lex Herfslut even competed in the World Solar Challenge for the University of Eindhoven, before realising the potential of applying what he had learned to everyday vehicles. This, my friends, is a rare tipping point in automotive history that can be tracked back decades to just one man and his rebellious vision to prove the world wrong, a vision that turned into something quite magnificent. That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I just have to say a quick thank you to the people from the World Solar Challenge and also the people from the Brunel Solar Team for allowing me to use their footage. You can check out their channels and websites using the links below. The next World Solar Challenge will be in 2023, so the best of luck to all participants, especially Team Brunel. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I will see you guys in the next one.